Liberty Me Live. We're here tonight with Zach Goschenauer. Uh, we're going to be talking about the legacy of Gordon Tullock, who unfortunately died uh, last month. He was a, a great economist, uh, though he didn't have a, a PhD in economics. He probably contributed uh, more to the way uh, ec economists think about uh, about the economics, uh, the political economy of politics, than almost anyone else uh, who, uh, sorry, uh, almost anyone who had a, a an economics degree. So uh, we're here with Zach Goshenauer, of course, who is a vi visiting assistant professor of economics at Western Carolina University. Uh, he got his PhD from uh, George Mason and also got his uh, bachelor's degree in economics and a BA uh, in mathematics from George Mason as well. He was a research assistant to for uh, Professor Brian Kaplan, who many of you certainly know and uh, respect. And he writes on the economics of immigration and also has a, a paper that's one of uh, my uh, favorite papers of last year on war and presidential greatness with uh, David Henderson. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Zach. Oh, thanks, Matt. Uh, so uh, I was asked to come talk about Gordon Tullock's legacy, which is uh, certainly an honor to do so. Gordon Tullock is one of my biggest influences personally, but um, he certainly influenced a lot of uh, economists greater note than me. So uh, let's get to it. Um, Gordon, <clears throat> Gordon Tullock. Oh, there's supposed to be a Tullock picture here. Uh, anyway, he, he did unfortunately die last year. Uh, of course, it's not too late for the uh, Nobel Committee to change their mind and start offering um, uh, prizes to uh, posthumously. But uh, uh, given their current rules, he will never get the prize that he deserves. But he is best known for his work in public choice theory and rent seeking. Um, well, I guess rent seeking is part of public choice theory, but uh, public choice theory is a broad program of research and economics, and rent seeking is probably the idea that he's most known for. So we'll talk about uh, both of those uh, contributions to, to some extent here. Uh, <clears throat> Education-wise, he received his JD in 1947 from University of Chicago, which he, will, he would later, way later, get an honorary PhD uh, in economics from University of Chicago, but he actually only took one class in economics as an undergraduate. And he doesn't have a baccalaureate degree because he, uh, he failed to or decided not to give them the $5 remittance required in order to get his uh, BA. So he only has his, his JD, which was interrupted a bit by uh, the fact that he was drafted to fight in World War II. So we'll talk a little bit about his uh, personal life uh, there. <laughs> yes, one, one class is all you need, especially if you're Gordon Tullock, who is... As uh, Buchanan used to always say, his frequent collaborator and uh, you know, famous co-writer there uh, would say that he's a natural economist, and and that is certainly true. He had a uh, a natural, uh, I guess you'd say, uh, affinity for the uh, study of economics, and he wrote articles in economics and got them published uh, before he even uh, had any sort of academic appointment. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that, too. So he spent much of his career with uh, James Buchanan, who is pretty well known as well, uh, also passed away recently, unfortunately. Uh, and their work together is very highly cited in the profession. So he he'd studied law and he intended to become a lawyer, which he did. He was an attorney for uh, a couple of, couple of years, and uh, he was an okay attorney. He won some cases, but... Uh, his heart wasn't wasn't really in it, um, but <clears throat> he was interrupted from his uh, studies to uh, go participate in World War II. He was uh, uh, part of the infantry, uh, the Ninth Infantry, uh, landed in uh, on Normandy uh, for the D-Day invasion. So he's he once said, uh, "Under democracy, I found myself walking up a beach in Normandy, and I wasn't very happy about it." And that was part of uh, his. Uh, I guess, one of his many quips that he's known for, uh, and he was often very quick to denounce sacred cows that, uh, that people had. So, 
Okay, so military service, which he wasn't very happy about, and he always said was uneventful, even though he uh, was, crossed the Rhine into, went into uh, what would eventually be Russian territory. He was all over Europe during, during that campaign. Uh, <clears throat> afterwards, he passed the, uh, what's notoriously difficult foreign service examination and did some uh, work for the State Depart U.S. State Department uh, in China which uh, they trained him on how to speak Chinese. Uh, he, he did some work in Ye at Yale learning that. And uh, his experience in China led him to write a couple of articles on the uh, monetary economics of China and Korea, uh, got those published before he ever uh, stepped foot back in a university in the, at, at a graduate level. Um, he spent several years there, and I think that his, his work there got him to uh, really think about the politic, the, the economics of politics, and, and really got him thinking. He wrote a lot on the economics of bureaucracy at this time, would eventually publish a book on that topic. Uh, after the Foreign Service, he came back <clears throat> and got into, uh, got into an academic career at uh, University of South Carolina. He would eventually join Jim Buchanan at UVA, which they had a great department there, which they completely ruined uh, by failing to promote certain people failing to give them the, uh, the support that they needed. Uh, they at one point had Coase, uh, Buchanan, Tulloch. Um, yeah, they, they lost everybody good, uh, or at least a, a good chunk of everybody good, uh, and yeah, big loss for them. So, so Tulloch and Buchanan went to uh, VPI, uh, which is now Virginia Tech. <clears throat> they were there for many years. They eventually got fed up there as well, and they came to uh, George Mason, uh, where they spent a, a huge part, both of them spent a huge part of their career there. Uh, at, at one point, Tulloch left and went to University of Arizona, and then he came back to George Mason University. He was a professor of economics and law at GMU. Unfortunately, I, I didn't overlap with him. He retired just uh, a couple of years before I started, uh, which is... Very sad for me uh, and for the rest of the department. They uh, definitely missed having him. Okay, so who influenced Tulloch? Um, let's say the Austrian School of Economics. It, he often credited as being a huge influence on him. He read Human Action when he was an undergraduate, uh, part of around the same time when he was taking that one class, which he, he took with Simons. Um, I say that he was a big influence because I'm sure that that had a, uh, uh, that really introduced him to the study of economics, uh, the formal study of economics, which he, he would eventually contribute a lot to, even though he didn't decide to go get a PhD or anything like that. Um, I, I don't want to uh, undersell this Austrian school thing. So uh, even though he, he did write quite a bit uh, critical of other uh, quote-unquote Austrian economists. Uh, he was very critical of things like the Austrian business cycle theory, which uh, he wrote a great article on that. Um, and I wouldn't necessarily say you would call him a member of the school, like died, uh, died in the wool type thing, but uh, certainly his approach to economics. You know, read the first hundred pages of, of Human Action and just uh, the idea that Nisi said that you apply eco economics to to everything. Uh, this is a way of understanding all human behavior, not some narrow uh, area of human behavior. Very important uh, to Tulloch, who is one of the great uh, economic imperialists, we often say. Um, let's see. Also influenced by the social choice school, uh, often Tulloch and Buchanan are called the founding fathers of public choice. If there is a, a real predecessor to that, a direct predecessor, be Duncan Black and Anthony Downs, uh, who started to apply these rational choice models to the study of politics, uh, but didn't really didn't really have the formalization uh, that Tulloch and Buchanan would later bring to it. But uh, I'd say these are the big influences. Uh, if you're familiar with Pete Becky's work on on a mainline economics. Uh, sort of going all the way back to Adam Smith and the classical economists who uh, worked in, in his tradition and then moving through with marginalism, moving into Menger and moving 
uh, into the Austrian school and combining that with the, the real uh, solid microeconomics of the Chicago school and the uh, schools that they influence, like UCLA, uh, you can sort of see this big uh, overarching school of thought going all the way back to Adam Smith, which, like I said, Pete Becky calls the main line of economics as opposed to a mainstream. So I wouldn't say Tulloch was necessarily a mainstream economist. He didn't uh, chase after the uh, whatever was new or cool. He wasn't particularly uh, technically sophisticated. He, he prided himself. He never like ran regressions. Um, he did a lot of work in game theory, but he was, he was no mathematician. Uh, he was just a really good economist uh, who really understood economics and applied it to things that uh, people who are too caught up in current trends could probably not think to apply it to. Uh, so looking at Tulloch's work, we'll go to the calculus of consent, because this is what really sets us up for having a, uh, uh, a public choice school of economics. So this is a, this is a, a work that uh, grew out of both Buchanan and Tulloch's work. So Buchanan asked uh, Tulloch to be involved in this project and come work with him at UVA, etc. Uh, they co-wrote this together. Uh, what Tulloch had written, this economic theory of constitutions, would eventually become a part of the book Calculus of Consent, which, uh, you know, if you're reading it, there's definitely a, a, a style difference between what was contributed by Tulloch and what was contributed by Buchanan, but um, uh, they were basically giving a rational choice model of political behavior and constitutions, how rules are, are formed, how collective action is formed, and taking all the romance, you know, Jim, Jim Buchanan wrote uh, Pol Politics Without Romance as a uh, sort of an introduction to public choice. So taking the romance or the civics class view of politics and setting that aside and saying, look, why don't we treat political actors just like other types of economic actors uh, and, <clears throat> and get away from this idea that the government works in some weird way that we can't explain with economics. Uh, there were, at the time, you know, go, go back to the 1950s and 60s and look at what economists were writing. And a lot of times they were falling victim to what Stigler would call the nirvana fallacy. And uh, that is sort of saying, okay, we, we identified this problem in markets, and uh, therefore let's just end our analysis there and say we can solve this problem by going and um, bringing in a government to, uh, to help uh, fix whatever market failures we've identified. So the idea behind Buchanan and Tulloch's work uh, in public choice was to say, no, uh, let's uh, be a little bit more critical in our analysis and then see where that leads us. So I'd say that, that really revolutionized how economists and then later political scientists and the whole uh, rational choice school of political science and how they all think about politics. Yeah. And a lot of times, people, it's not that people will always cite Tulloch or cite Buchanan. Or, or, uh, it's more of just it really changed the way they, th they thought about it, because now it's, we can now use economics to analyze this type of behavior, whereas before we weren't doing that so much. Um, within the school of public choice, the idea that Tulloch is most well known for is this idea of rent seeking. And the idea here is that we incur costs to increase our wealth share without increasing the total wealth. Okay. So what that means is sometimes I might want to increase my wealth, so maybe I start a business. Okay, that's not rent-seeking. That's me creating new wealth. But if I see that there's some sort of monopoly that's uh, available, if I lobby the government for that monopoly and I spend a lot of resources on that, that's rent-seeking. So the article which introduces this idea, formalizes this idea, is a 1967 article, his by far most famous and most cited, on the welfare costs of tariffs, monopolies, and theft. Right? And in that article, he would argue that welfare costs were vastly underestimated by the traditional approach. Uh, and just, uh, let's see. I, I had a picture there, but uh, for some reason it's not there. Uh, not important. Uh, the idea is that if, if you are familiar, if you've taken an economics class and you think about a deadweight loss triangle, what they call a, a Harberger triangle, where there's either too little or too much production, and therefore there's this allocated inefficiency there, uh, that's only a very small part, according to Tulloch, 
of the whole uh, the whole dead weight loss that we should really be considering. So, so it's not just that uh, we now have a little bit too much or a little bit not enough production. It's that there's this monopoly profit available, and if that monopoly profit is sort of up for sale, you could say, uh, if the if the government is able to grant you, say, a monopoly or prevent uh, protect you from competition, say, from other countries. Uh, then whatever the value of that monopoly profit is, well, that's how much you would be willing to spend in order to protect, or in order to gain uh, that privilege, okay? So it's not just you, it's all of your competitors are also thinking about how they would like to gain that privilege. So they'll uh, spend resources on how to get it. And I think a lot of uh, Tulloch's other work comes from this very basic idea that uh, the, if you if you allow rents to be created, if there are rents uh, out there, uh, people will expend resources in order to get it, and that leads us to some really inefficient outcomes. Okay, so uh, some of the other things that he was really well known for writing about uh, that are relate, still related to that idea <clears throat> are in the field of law in economics, which he was a sort of a founding uh, member of as well. Uh, one thing I'd really like to talk about is the transitional gains trap. Uh, this still gets lots of sites. He, he first talked about it, formalized it in 1975 article for the Bell Journal of Economics. And what he's saying here is that a lot of times uh, someone will end up with some kind of rent or some benefit, and we would like perhaps as a society to buy them out of, their, of that benefit. But we don't have that capability because that requires collective action. So just for an example, okay, say uh, you get, uh, you sell taxi medallions in, in New York City. Uh, and the first people who get the taxi medallions, of course, uh, they now have this huge rent uh, because no one can compete with them without the medallions. So uh, they go for a, for a long time and then all of a sudden we realize, wait a minute, no, we didn't issue enough taxi medallions and the population of New York City is much higher than it used to be. We need more taxis. Uh, but there's a problem. If we try to sell more medallions, we're going to be reducing the value of the, of the original rent. Uh, so, the, so who should we expect to, uh, to fight against the uh, issuing of new medallions? Well, we should expect the taxi companies to fight against that. Okay. So he, he applied this to a lot of other cases. I really like another example with blue laws. So what's the idea there? Uh, blue laws mean you can't do business on Sundays. Uh, so what happens when you, when, you pass a, uh, when you pass a law that says no one can do business on Sundays? Well, then everyone needs to do their shopping on Monday through Saturday. Uh, so uh, maybe someone has to open up a new store because a lot of people want to go shopping and you know, the stores are too crowded, so it's very costly to stand in line and all that other stuff. So more stores get opened. Now all of a sudden we realize, wait a minute, these blue laws were stupid. Uh, we want to uh, be able to shop on Sunday, but we can't just repeal that law because then uh, there's, there are actually now too many stores. So the, the stores who exist now are going to uh, lobby and spend a lot of resources uh, in order to protect their gain. Okay, so there's, there's a lot of really good uh, work has come from that. Uh, examples of that are... Uh, uh, more than you can really count. Okay. Uh, other things that he wrote about, he, he has a great case against common law. So there's a lot of uh, work. Uh, libertarians seem to love common law. Uh, Tullix uh, was sort of a contrarian. He sort of jumped out and said, uh, wait a minute, common law doesn't make that much sense because you've got this adversarial system. So uh, one side is spending a ton of money in order to defend. And then in order to defeat the defense, the prosecution spends a ton of money in order to prosecute. And wouldn't it be better if we just had a system where uh, there wasn't that adversarial relationship and people were actually just looking for the truth? Now, he, did, he didn't really explore, like, well, what would actually happen in reality? Uh, you know, he wasn't, like, out there lobbying to change, to get rid of common law. He's just saying that common law has uh, an inefficiency within it that a lot of people probably aren't really thinking about. Uh, a lot of wasted resources. Doesn't mean, that it, it could still be the best system that's available, but it's not perfect. 
Uh, one thing that he's pretty well known for is this uh, automobile safety uh, idea, which I don't actually remember which paper it comes from, but it's people talk about it all the time, so uh, it's worth mentioning. Uh, his idea here is that there's <laughs> there's an increase once you require people to wear seatbelts. There's an increase in car accidents and fa car fatalities, and the idea is well, how does that make sense? Uh, and I always use this with my intro economics classes, just to, to get people to think about unintended consequences. All right. So the the idea is okay. Now that you're wearing a seatbelt, now that you're required to wear a seatbelt. You always had the option to wear a seatbelt. Okay. But now that you're required to wear a seatbelt, if you don't really value that increased safety, you can say, well, look, I'm safer now, therefore I can drive faster. So what happens when you pass a law that tells everyone that uh, they have to wear seatbelts? People drive faster. When people drive faster, they still sometimes get into accidents and then they die. So he was pretty famous for recommending instead of a uh, instead of an, uh, a seatbelt requirement uh, or or a requirement for airbags or whatever, why don't they install a big spike? Uh, and the spike could be coming right out of the steering wheel, and then you would actually now think about, wait a minute, what are my incentives here? If I if I drive too fast and I get into an accident. The stake is going to go right into my heart, uh, rather than thinking, oh, if I get into an accident, there's going to be a big airbag that's going to protect me and a seatbelt that's going to protect me and that kind of thing. So um, he's very well known for applying these the idea that incentives and costs matter and applying it to a ton of different topics that no one had really thought of. Uh, so see, so the biggest part of his legacy, and, and uh, I want to keep coming back to this point. The biggest part of his legacy is applying the economic way of thinking to every aspect of human behavior and not just a very narrow range of market transactions and that kind of thing. So uh, when they first created the journal, which would become public choice, it was called Papers in Non-Market Decision-Making. And his, his biggest... Uh, his area of research, I guess you could really call non-market decision-making. Uh, probably the best class I took at George Mason was Peter Leeson taught a class in non-market decision-making, and it was kind of based on the ideas, what kind of topics did people talk about uh, at George Mason or at UVA when, when uh, Tulloch and Buchanan are really first starting this idea? It wasn't all politics. Of course, politics is a huge part of non-market decision-making. Yeah. A lot of uh, decisions that would be uh, that once they're not private, once you're talking about externalities, those uh, frequently become political issues. But it's not it's not all politics, and I think that uh, there's a uh, probably a view, especially among non-economists who know just a little bit about public choice, that it's all about politics. But it also it's about crime, uh, it's about law, it's about religion. It's you know it, it's all these different ways that we structure society other than uh, with uh, just politics, okay. So, but speaking of politics, uh, my favorite book by uh, Talik is his book on autocracy. So uh, a lot of public choice and the economics of politics looks at uh, democracies. The so calculus consent of consent is primarily about democracies. But he wanted to make it very clear that Public choice wasn't just about democracy. You, know, you can apply the same lessons to thinking about dictatorships. And he's like, the way that historians and pop, uh, political scientists have been looking at, excuse me, uh, have been looking at autocracies is all wrong. We should be thinking about what, you know, what are the economic incentives for the dictator? Uh, what are the incentives for the uh, people under the dictator, for his potential rivals, etc. So uh, one thing uh, that comes out of it, Tulloch is known for all these paradoxes, and I'll, I'll talk about a couple more, but uh, a great uh, paradox from the autocracy book is this paradox of revolution, where he basically says, look, it doesn't make sense to be a revolutionary. If you, if you want there to be change personally, okay, you can't, uh, you know, your one person, your one action, is not going to overcome the uh, uh, the system. You know, you, you're you need a lot of people, and if there are already a lot of people taking part in the revolution, then doesn't it make sense for you to just stay home and not take any of the risk, and then just hope that everyone else is successful? 
Okay, so the, he said, but it's weird because revolutions seem to happen all the time. So uh, could this possibly be? The way that he explained it is to essentially say, look, there's no such thing as a popular revolution. So revolutions are really just thinly veiled competitions between two groups of elites. Uh, so one group of elites in power and the other group says, okay, well, we're going to have a, uh, we'll have a revolution. And uh, they'll walk around and they'll, they'll get a popular revolution uh, by just kind of walking from town to town and forcing people who live in that town uh, to join up with the revolution. You know? And you say, oh, well, they all just volunteered for a revolution. But if a bunch of armed revolutionaries come to your town and they have guns and they say, hey, uh, do you want to join the revolution? Uh, you're probably not going to say no. Uh, that that's probably not be a great idea. Uh, so other than just talking about the difference between dictatorships and democracies, he talked about the difference between uh, what he called a dictatorship and a monarchy. So monarchy would have a hereditary system of government, and he, he talked about how the uh, incentives are a bit different in that situation than if uh, the dictatorship is controlled by, you know, just whoever is the most powerful at one given point. Um, he talks about how the dictator is constrained by the fact that he's got to uh, protect against all these people who are always looking to take his throne, take his power, so he can't just do whatever he wants, as many people suggest. Uh, so there's a lot to be said there, and I, I think this is a really important part of his legacy because this is a very underexplored area of his thought. Uh, I still think that there's not enough work done on how autocracies make decisions. Now, when he first wrote the book, he said, look, why aren't, why aren't we looking at autocracy? This is the form of government that is most common. This is the form of government that's most common in history, and it's still definitely true that it's the most common form of government in history, but not quite so clear that uh, autocracy is on the rise or anything like that. Since the time that he wrote this book, a lot of autocratic regimes have fallen and are at least nominally uh, democratic now. Uh, so he's got some other paradoxes. Uh, this paradox of government growth is really interesting and certainly underexplored. Um, these ideas, look, for thousands of years we had human society and governments were never that big. All of a sudden now you get to the 20th century and there's the skyrocketing in the size of government. Uh, so a few authors have tried to tackle this. Uh, I think um, certainly Bob Higgs and his work on, on ratchet theory and uh, Tyler Cowan and George Mason. A uh, well-known blogger and economist uh, has written a bit about this paradox of government growth and how technology has enabled the government to grow much larger than it used to be. Uh, but no real good answer in my mind. Uh, certainly not a settled issue. He's also famous for this uh, Tulloch paradox of why is there so little money in politics? So since it seems that there is so much to gain by uh, be getting in power, uh, having your friends be in power, it seems that people would be willing to spend a lot of money in order to seek these rents. Uh, and even though we're concerned with the amount of uh, money that gets spent on lobbying and the amount of money that goes into campaigning and stuff like that, uh, really, yeah. well, I just saw a graphic this past Halloween that uh, you know more money is spent on Halloween candy than is spent on uh, political campaigns. Uh, that's like all the political campaigns. So uh, certainly it seems like it's it's worth more to be in power than people are willing to spend. So uh, there's certainly a question that I don't think we have a good answer for. Why, why ultimately is there so little money in politics? I think some of the answers that have come out have something to do with, uh, well, uh, money doesn't actually seem to buy votes in the way that many people have assumed. Uh, once you get your person in power, there's very little guarantee that he will uh, follow through with all the promises. So maybe it just doesn't make sense to invest in uh, political rent seeking at that level. So uh, another thing that Tulloch is well known for among economists, but probably not the uh, wider public, is his contributions to bioeconomics or uh, sociobiology, I guess you could also say. Um, so he's, he originally had a manuscript called Coordination Without Command, and then it eventually became a great book uh, called The Economics of Non-Human Societies. Uh, there are some great stories of 
how he did his research for this book of just standing outside of his office, looking at an ant colony, uh, trying to figure out, well, what is it that they're doing? How can I explain their behavior economically? Um, yeah. <clears throat> kind of just applying the ideas not only to, of economics, not only to uh, politics and all these other non-market uh, situations, but also to uh, other types of animals and even plants. Okay, so he, he was really a, it's kind of uh, looking at well, how do agents coordinate, uh, even if they don't have like an advanced language or an advanced society, uh, that, that we would call an advanced society and stuff like that. So he, he did a lot of the pioneering work on this, and I don't think, I think it's very underexplored uh, and not very much as, uh, not very many people have written um, uh, and really taken his uh, insights into account, I think, on the uh, on that area. He's also uh, wrote a bit about natural suboptimality. Suboptim so uh, basically countering the idea that nature should uh, come to some great conclusion. Okay, so, so one thing that he's saying is that uh, in nature, there's a lot of coordination, even though you don't have this, some big heavy hand. There's no, no, no command. Okay, so this is a very Hayekian, uh, spontaneous order type idea. But on the other hand, he's saying just because an order is spontaneous doesn't necessarily mean it's good. Okay, so just because something is natural, uh, just, you know, the natural world doesn't necessarily mean that the natural world is good, even from the perspective of, of someone who appreciates nature. Okay, so say you really want, uh, you know, some uh, ecosystem to, to survive and thrive, some species of plants, some species of animals. Yeah, you know, taking your preferences for granted, it's not necessarily true that uh, just allowing nature to run its course is going to give you the best results as possible. So uh, I think that uh, he, a lot of what Tulloch did, it seems like, was motivated by just like wanting to take people off. Um, but he would start thinking very critically about what other people. Uh, truly believed, but he didn't really think had a good economic justification. So, um, I'd say that uh, his his legacy has an impact that's felt throughout economics. Certainly, he held a lot of very important positions: uh, Southern Economic Association, American Economic Association, uh, was the longtime editor of the of the journal Public Choice, uh, wrote a lot of articles. I uh, wrote a number of books, a great collection of his work is published by Liberty Fund. I would definitely recommend picking that up. Um, I'd say that his uh, influence is particularly strong in George Mason, uh, not just because these are people that I'm more familiar with, but uh, these are people that he worked with and people who came to study under him and that kind of thing. So uh, I would say, for example, Peter Leeson, Brian Kaplan, people who cite Tulloch frequently and really grapple with Tulloch's ideas uh, and, and, and try to meet his challenges. So uh, he's certainly a huge influence on people who are writing today. Uh, he'll certainly be uh, an influence tomorrow and I think years to come. Uh, I th his work touches so many topics uh, that it could be the basis for a number of new research agendas. And when people say, uh, ask me about graduate education in economics and what should I read, I always say Tulloch. Tulloch is a great jumping off point uh, for uh, almost any issue. Plus, if you wrote about it, you certainly want to read what he wrote because he's really smart. All right, so uh, that's all the slides I have. So I guess I'm ready for Q&A. Thanks so much. That's uh, a great overview of someone who certainly had a, a great impact. Where do you think his impact has been uh, felt the most? I mean, an undergrad in political science, I never heard his name, but I heard a lot of ideas that he explored, uh, particularly in, in one or two classes. And I, I would suspect that those, uh, those professors had probably read Tulloch in, in their PhD programs. But do you think it's in political science or economics, political economy? Uh, I mean, certainly economics. Uh, I never talked to an economist who didn't know who Gordon Tulloch was. 
Um, I've certainly talked to plenty of political scientists who weren't familiar with his work. Uh, but I think even even if you're not familiar with who Tulloch is and exactly what he wrote, uh, you can't really escape uh, his his impact at this point. So if you're working in political science, you really can't uh, just sidestep the whole rational choice model of, of human behavior. So the political scientists are not going to take you seriously if you have just a complete naive civics class view of how the government works. Uh, and, and of course, that's not just Tulloch, that's a lot of other writers, especially James Buchanan. Um, but even, even if you don't know Tulloch precisely, uh, and a lot of people don't know his name, because, and I think a lot of that is because of his personality. Uh, he, was quite, he was very abrasive. He, he liked to get on people's nerves, uh, that kind of thing. Of course, everything I've heard is that all that is a big mask for the fact that he was a real softy at heart, and everyone who worked with him uh, knew that he was you know, a great guy. He was very gracious to the people who worked for him and with him. And um, a lot of people who have been insulted by Tulloch see that as a true badge of honor. So one of my, my great regrets in life is that I've, I wasn't able to be insulted by Tulloch. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, so his, his influence in economics is huge. Um, but I'd say more than other economists, his influence can be felt in a lot of other areas, particularly political science. I guess I should tell people how they can ask questions. If you'd like to ask a question, you can ask in the little Q&A box in the bottom left. Um, another question from me. Uh, why do you think it took so long for economists to get the idea that maybe they shouldn't assume that politicians have good intentions and kind of apply that insight to politics and look at really at an incentives? I mean, if you go all the way back to Bastiat and uh, you and Adam Smith, and people were thinking about this. Now, they weren't thinking it about it on the level of um, of Tulloch and Buchanan, I think, and they they weren't using those modern tools. So, I, so I think that there's there's something weird that happened in political economy where uh, the original, the classical guys were really thinking about uh, the relationship between all the different aspects of society. Um, you know, certainly Adam Smith, not you know, father of economics, but also working in a philosophical, moral philosophy tradition. Um, and I think a lot of these guys really did uh, understand uh, that economics could apply to a lot of things, and somehow that was lost. Was the formalization of economics, uh, the mathematization of economics, somehow it was lost, and I think people just got very risk averse. And they got into a particular way of thinking uh, and uh, following fashions. I mean, the, uh, the sort of the battles in economics just keep repeating, coming over and over again. All these ideas now of, of is economics too formal? Are we asking big enough questions? You know, these these aren't just like topics that just came up. Uh, these are uh, battles and debates that just keep happening over and over and over again. Um, Great book on that topic is Larry White's Clash of Economic Ideas. Now, uh, how would you respond to the critique of some Austrians who would say that, you know, uh, the public choice, uh, it's nice at a, a very top level thinking, but then they get way too formal about it and they get into the weeds? Um. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that there's uh, parts of, say, calculus of consent, which are a little bit too formal. I don't think that there's a lot gained uh, with the mathematical models that they use. Um, uh, certainly, there's some attempt to just kind of appeal to other economists. Uh, maybe I'm alone in this thinking uh, among other public choice economists, but uh, what I, I, I focused on today, I tried to focus on the, 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 the big ideas. And Tulloch was a big ideas guy. He he wasn't uh, you know, he wasn't uh, caught up in the formalization. He, he did a bit of that. Uh, he he certainly knew how to do it and how to communicate in that way. Uh, but I think that that's that's not really the biggest value gained in public choice. Uh, the biggest value gained is just the the application of the economic way of thinking to a lot of different areas, which are uh, uh, which can, be, can get a lot of value out of, out of applying that way of thinking. So I think that uh, other people who are criticizing, say, Tulloch for that, I think they need to go back and, and look at what he really said. Um, and, you know, if you, if you look at 
if you get caught up in, a, in some sort of mathematical model and you don't think it's relevant, then uh, you know you can typically move on. I, I don't think that there's a ton of this part of the contribution at all. Now, one of the the problems uh, when I first got into Austrian economics, there were all these resources there. And then I started hearing about, you know, public choice, and I was very interested. But there are so few uh, public choice books online. There are m uh, many fewer papers than you get in kind of the uh, the more, uh, not mainstream, but uh, kind of the more core Austrian stuff with Mises and Rothbard. You can find all of that online for free. How can we get these ideas out there more? Because I, I talk to Austrians on a regular basis who, I mean, they may have heard the term uh, rational ignorance, and that's about as far as their understanding of these ideas goes. I mean, past an intuitive level. Um, probably the best resource that I can think of uh, uh, probably the best resource that I can think of is the Library of Economics and Liberty. Uh, go to econlib.org. I can put a, uh, I'll put a link in the chat here, um, where you can read a lot of uh, Tulloch and Buchanan, especially Buchanan's work on public choice. Uh, I think if you, if you look around, there's, uh, you know, the public choice school is not as well organized, I think, as uh, as the as a, as, a, as a group with some sort of coherent message uh, as, as perhaps other schools of thought that people are, are more um, familiar with. Uh, certainly there's a ton of uh, Misesian stuff available online, Hayekian stuff that's available online. Um, and uh, there, there's, probably, I guess, just a bigger fan club for that kind of thing. Um, but if you, if you look online, you can find most of what Tulloch wrote and you can find most of what Buchanan wrote, I think, uh, without looking too, too hard, um, and uh, just read articles that come out. I mean, there's a uh, if you, especially if you have some kind of access to JSTOR or any kind of academic access, um, uh, a lot of articles uh, are are available or have, have accessibility, uh, even for people who are not professional economists. Um, Tulloch has an undergraduate book uh, that he wrote. Uh, that's available for sale, uh, and let's see. Nothing else is jumping out at me. It, it's, it's certainly not that uh, wealth of information that you can find very easily, like you can find, say, all of Mises' stuff online. But um, uh, like I said earlier, uh, all the complete, or the I guess you say the selected works, which is several several volumes of Gordon Tullock's work, is published in a great. Uh, anthology by the uh, by Liberty Fund, so uh, I, I definitely highly recommend that. And Buchanan's work, uh, they also publish an anthology of his work. So if you're willing to put, spend a little bit of money, you can you can own those books. And other uh, other than those, are there any uh, any books that you would recommend for people who are really getting into these ideas? Uh, sure, um, yeah, but certainly Tulloch isn't the end uh, of the school of thought. Uh, he's got a lot of great stuff, but um, if I, I think if you're looking at the modern application uh, of public choice, the, the best book in public choice, I'd say, in the past couple of decades is Brian Kaplan's Myth of the Rational Voter. Uh, so once you kind of understand where Buchanan and Tulloch were coming from, then you can understand a lot of the... Uh, the critiques that were given uh, of their of that view, say from the Chicago School, Donald Whitman, that kind of thing, and then I think you come back around to Brian Kaplan to to understand uh, how you can uh, counter those arguments and reach the same conclusions that Tulloch and Buchanan uh, reached about the efficiency or, of government and the types of incentives that government actors have. Um, also, I really highly recommend if you love Tulloch. You'll love Peter Leeson. Uh, so I definitely recommend Peter Leeson's work. Uh, he's got uh, several books, uh, articles coming out every day. He's a machine. 
Uh, and he's very Tolkien in my mind, uh, also an economist, economist, uh, and a natural economist. So, um, yeah. can't really think of anything that that's jumping out at me other than that. But uh, that's a good place to start. What do you think is the most important idea from public choice that hasn't really been uh, subsumed into uh, into the zeitgeist and by other economists? Um, so I, I think that Buchanan and Tulloch, uh most economists are um, uh, they, they grapple with a little bit, but I, I still think that there's, there's a little bit of resistance to the idea that you can apply the economic way of thinking to any topic. Uh, so so that, I still think that there's resistance to that even in the economics profession, which uh, that's, that's unfortunate, but I, um, uh, there, there's still a little bit of that there. As far as any, any single idea that hasn't really uh, caught on, um, I, I really... I think that uh, the the idea of rational irrationality and Brian Kaplan's work is very underappreciated. It's not just because I work with him, um, but I don't think that uh, the the idea that people have preferences over beliefs is taken quite seriously enough in the wider in the wider profession. So, I mean, uh, the idea of political economy is certainly making a comeback, and the institutional approach. Uh, it's economics is huge. Um, uh, recently, uh, Eleanor Ostrom's work was honored by uh, the, the wider profession, and and that of course fits uh, very nicely in with this whole Virginia political economy, Austrian economics, uh, institutional economics framework uh, that that I think is making a real comeback. Um, and, and if you look at work of even some really prominent mainstream economists like uh, uh, Darren Asimoglu uh, and you look at the work that he's doing it, it's it, it's not naive um, but it doesn't it still doesn't fully appreciate what Buchanan and Tulloch were doing I, I think uh, it focuses t on, on too many small details uh, a little bit of um, uh, technical prowess uh, over uh, really getting at what the ideas are uh, Let's see, what else? Uh, right, I, yeah, I think um, uh, just the behavioral uh, idea. Many George Mason types and, and Austrian types might get mad at me for saying this, but I'm thinking uh, the idea that people have preferences over beliefs, uh, the Brian Kaplan type stuff, uh, I don't think that people who are even working in public choice right now are taking that quite seriously enough. But uh, so it, it is it is starting to come back. There's a, there's a bit of uh, work being done on political entrepreneurship and how um, what, how politicians kind of manufacture issues uh, in order to uh, drum up support. Uh, so some really great work being done there by uh, Deanna Thomas and people working with her. Um, uh, so, so I think that it, it's certainly an active area of research uh, that is a bit underappreciated, uh, but uh, it really has been uh, had a lot of impact. So, uh, like I said, I don't think that there are people who just who don't know Tolik or don't know his work. Um, oh, the the stuff on the sociobiology stuff uh, that basically nothing has been done with. Uh, you know, from Tulloch's point of view, and, and it's it's not my area of expertise, uh, certainly, but I, I'm, I'm always looking for people who are going to cite the economics of non-human societies. Uh, I think that there's more important work that can be done there. Well, very cool. I mean, thanks so much for giving this rundown. I, I know a lot of people just still aren't aren't really familiar with this line of thought. And I, I hope to uh, hope we can push this video and maybe get more people to understand these ideas. Thanks so much for coming and talking to us, and uh, thank you for honoring Tulloch in this way. And I appreciate you coming. Thanks everyone uh, for coming tonight. I'll uh, actually put out a last call here for questions and let people know.
what's going on at Liberty Me Live. Um, Sunday night, we've got the continuation of Jeffrey Tucker's Liberty Classic series. A Monday night, we've got uh, Professor uh, Stephen Miller. Uh, he's going to talk about one reason why education is overrated. And then Tuesday night, we're going to have uh, Lucy Steigerwald and Angela Keaton from Antiwar.com. And they always uh, are very entertaining and informative. So hope to see you all back here in the next week at Liberty Me Live. Uh, looks like we're out of questions. So thanks so much, Zach. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Have a great night. Thanks.